and uh, beautiful sunny day outside, so thanks very much for coming along. <clears throat> what I want to do to kick things off is to take you back uh, to uh, early prehistory, going back to uh, some of the earliest activity in Scotland <laughs> after the Ice Age. But first uh, of all, I need to say, of course, that I'm merely a representative of many people, many institutions, and many specialisations. Uh, indeed, many other people than those listed on the board, but uh, these are some of the principal figures in the project. <clears throat> so we're going back to Mesolithic Scotland, um, roughly the period between 8,500 BC coming up to the beginning of farming, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you that uh, this is a time before farming when uh, we're looking at hunter-gatherers who are generally moving into and around Scotland. And in fact, as you will become aware as, the, as my talk goes on, uh, we do have some interesting evidence from the early farming period as well. Now, when we're talking about hunter-gatherers, our whole assumption of their way of life is that they're moving round the landscape uh, and they have a, a territorial use, if you like. They have a close knowledge of what is available within that landscape and they're making the most of it. It may not be an annual round. They may visit some places more than once in the year. They may visit them less than once a year. They may sometimes visit with a whole community, occasionally with part of the community. <clears throat> what we're looking at is a highly adapted, highly sophisticated uh, society who are making the most of what is available, what Scotland has to offer. But we have a problem with that. The existing evidence suggests that these people have a focus on the coast. Now, I couldn't find a map of every Mesolithic site in Scotland, and personally, I hate distribution maps, but that's a different lecture. Um, so I put this one up from Scarf. Of course, this has some Paleolithic sites on it as well, but it's interesting because it shows you some of the key sites that uh, were used in order to discuss <coughs> Mesolithic and Paleolithic settlement in Scotland. And you can see that there are indeed some sites in the interior, but that most sites cluster around the coast. The problem for us is, is that a genuine piece of archaeological evidence? Were there more sites along the coast? Or is it an artifact of both archaeology and the way we study archaeology? Is it because, for example, it's easier to see sites along the coast? We generally find sites today where there's development, roads, houses, supermarkets, and so on. So it shouldn't be as perhaps a surprise to us if our sites reflect <coughs> where we do things today rather than where people did them in the past. So our problem is finding sites in those other areas. And of course, dealing with upland areas, much harder to find the sites, particularly when you're dealing with sites that are only characterized by a handful of stone tools. Mesolithic sites are difficult enough to find uh, no big footprint, no nice stone circles, upstanding stone houses or uh, structures or anything. Difficult to find anyway. How do we find them in this sort of landscape? Well, 10 years ago, I know it was 10 years ago because it was uh, on my birthday and I just had another one. Um, a, a significant birthday, I would hasten to add. Um, a small group of enthusiasts gathered uh, in the upper reaches of the D to look at the location where some uh, stone tools had been found, characteristically Mesolithic stone tools. And here you can see us uh, enthusiastically looking for stone tools. They'd actually come up along the footpath that you can see here. Um, this footpath in National Trust for Scotland work to uh, renew the footpath, but we were finding more material in the erosion faces along the river there. And so uh, the D Tributaries project was born. It's been uh, 
perhaps a little while in getting itself together, but uh, for the last few years, uh, we've been working uh, as a sort of consortium, if you like, of institutions with the aim of investigating and managing the prehistoric archaeology uh, in this area of the Cairngorms. And I would say that both are really important because this is National Trust for Scotland land. Obviously, they have many different aspects of the land that they need to ensure the well-being. Archaeology is only one of them, but we can only manage the archaeology if we understand what's there. This is uh, the area, some nice, uh, sort of, tried to throw in a few gratuitous pictures of mountains and things. Um, here you can see the three areas that we're focusing on, which are the areas where stone tools have come up. Uh, up the Galdivan here, and then two along the D. This is the upper reach of the D. Um, here at Chest of D around the, the waterfalls, for anyone that knows the area, and then just a bit further up. So, as I said, uh, stone tools came up uh, initially during footpath maintenance. The question is how to deal with the archaeology. So, we've been doing a different, th uh, different number of uh, techniques, trying them out, uh, really in some ways trying to pioneer work up in this sort of environment. So, uh, looking at uh, the geomorphology, how the area has uh, developed, what might have happened to the archaeology, paleoenvironmental analysis, obviously what was the world like when people were up here, walkover survey, geophysics, and finally leading on to excavation. And as I said earlier, this whole thing is very, very much integrated with the management. For example, this is an area where uh, in the, the waters of the Dee, they're have, doing a lot of tree planting in order to try and reduce the temperature of the water, in order to uh, work and improve conditions for the freshwater mussels. This is the Pearls in Peril project. Unfortunately for us, it's along the banks of the river where you get the archaeology, and this is where they're planting trees. So it's really trying to work together on this sort of thing. So here you can see people planting trees. <coughs> Geomorphology is really important. It's a complicated area in some ways, in other ways not so underlying at all. We've got glacial till, and in some cases the archaeology is really sitting below the peat on the till in other areas. Um, like here at Chest of Dee, there are alluvial sands uh, in between ridges of till, and there's obviously been several uh, flooding events and the archaeology is sitting on the top of the alluvial sand. So we're still working on understanding exactly how these sites have survived. Interestingly, we do have material in situ. We've got fire pits and other things. So it's not, as we first thought, a redeposited um, selection of material, but we have actually got, if you like, first-hand evidence of the people who were up here using this area. Paleo environment, really, really important. Um, they're unlikely to be, even in the Neolithic, farming up here. So what are they exploiting, particularly in the Mesolithic? What is the attraction of coming up into this area? And how are they surviving up here? Yeah. Interestingly, we've got dates that cover uh, what's known as the 8.2 blip, uh, which is 6,200 <coughs> BC, uh, 8,200 years ago, roughly. Uh, the evidence right across Scotland suggests quite a severe climatic downturn. We get uh, interesting things going on, in fact, elsewhere in uh, northwest Europe. Um, we've got dates associated with archaeological evidence for people up here then. So how are they surviving? No Gore-Tex then. No nice bubble tents or anything. What's going on? Um, so very interesting different sort of landscape to the landscape that we see today. I mean, there is evidence for more tree cover and things in this early period. <coughs> what are we doing? Well, initially, walkover survey. This has two purposes, both to characterise the landscape, to look at 
uh, what the landscape's like, where there's erosion, where sites are coming out uh, to build up management plans and things, but also obviously to look for visible archaeology. So you can see here the sort of map that's being produced and the sort of sites that we're finding, or rather what we do when we find stone tools <coughs> and things. So in some cases, we can pick up stone tools uh, on the surface of, say, an erosion uh, face or something and then record them in. Geophysics, very much speculative, but uh, Rose Geophysics uh, has been working up there, uh, doing surveys, and then we can do test pits and things in order to see whether uh, the anomalies are reflected in terms of human behaviour or natural events. And uh, indeed, of course, many of them will turn out to be natural, but in some cases we have picked up stone tools and archaeological evidence in areas where they've suggested things might be going on. So that's been very worthwhile. Then test pitting. Uh, luckily, being the University of Aberdeen, the University of Dublin, we've got uh, plenty of students willing to come up to this area and spend their uh, <coughs> summers digging little holes through areas of moorland. And in many cases, perhaps not getting very much, but in other cases, getting archaeological evidence, which is really exciting. The finds are small. I don't know how many people here have worked on a Mesolithic site, but you're not finding nice big finds. Um, but they are, when you get them, really nice. In some of the trenches, very few pieces. In others, as you will see, an awful lot. But this is a sample from some of the Dublin work a couple of years ago. Then moving on to larger trenches here. Again, Dublin have been working along the Galdiburn, um, and you can see one of their larger trenches and a nice little pit showing up here during excavation and then after excavation, and obviously looking from the, from the other side, but here it is in section. And this rock, particularly nice here, actually with stone tools sitting on the top of it. Um, so these are some of the things um, that, you know, nice in situ archaeology when you start looking for it. Along Whitebridge, really running between Whitebridge, which is the last place where you'll get a Land Rover, and then up the D uh, towards the waterfalls up here. Um, I think you can just make out areas of test pits. And then up here, we've actually been focusing on this area, which has produced a lot of interest. The lithics first came up here, I would say, along area D here. Um, so we've got quite a lot of evidence from here, and then I'm just going to move to this area in the next picture. Um, so here you've got the pool just below the waterfalls, and you can see our test pits along here. Quite a lot of evidence of fire. Um, not really hard, it's not um, sort of flat stones, but more fire pits, um, hollows with full of charcoal and things. So what we seem to have, uh, certainly along the, the side of the D, is occupation along a sandbar, which would have been standing high beside the river, particularly uh, activity going on around the waterfalls, and that's very interesting um, for those of us sort of interested in the, the wider landscape aspect, what are they doing up there generally? Just a, a very quick, you can see the um, deposits, some nice colours and charcoal, which they're uh, coming along here. Sorts of stone tools, um, <coughs> many of flints, some very, very nice little Blade cores. Interestingly, I've been working recently uh, with site of nether mills, uh, which is much further down the Dee, nearer the sea. And at nether mills, we get very similar blade cores, but they're about twice the size. Now, we haven't got enough evidence to sort of look at whether it's the same blade cores moving up and they're just more worked out. But for me, that's quite an interesting thing to look at. Um, some nice uh, little retouched pieces. 
Uh, I would call them microliths, but actually we've just got early Neolithic dates for these two broader pieces here, so that's quite interesting. But also quartzite, um, tools made of local quartzites. Where the flint comes from, we would kind of assumed it was coming up from the sea, but we're beginning to wonder whether some of it is from local till deposits. That's something we need to look at in more detail. The dating, uh, we have, not surprisingly, given the, the range of landscape across which activity has been taking place, we've got a, a span of dates, dates from every millennium, if you like. Um, I'm not going to sort of leave this on, but as uh, you know, it's all being recorded, so you can go back to look at these. Um, and I've put it uh, into a, a more kind of textual form, if you like, but we've got evidence going right back into the, well into the early period of the Mesolithic, but coming through into the Neolithic and also the Bronze Age. So th this is an area that is used over the millennia. And of course, we still use it today. It's on the Larry Gru. It's a well-known pathway through the mountains. Up by the waterfall, interestingly, Really nice pit. Sadly, it's got Bronze Age dates, not Mesolithic. I was quite hoping it might be Mesolithic. But um, definitely things going on late Neolithic and then into the um, Bronze Age there. And I don't know if you know the waterfall, but it's a very spectacular site. It marks a, a, a sort of notable change in the landscape. So you go from a slightly broader plain with the river running through, and then you have this rocky ridge and you go up the waterfall and you come out into a different landscape above it. So it's definitely a kind of liminal uh, marked area, no matter how you want to express it or explain it um, in kind of emotional terms, if you like, but also, of course, an interesting area in terms of resources, salmon fishing, all sorts of things uh, possible up there. Or once possible, I'm told the salmon on the D aren't particularly good at the moment. Uh, I'm sorry about that little animation, that's coming from Dublin and uh, I couldn't uh, get over it. But um, anyway, back to the stone tools, just um, to give you a bit more of an idea of the sort of thing that we've got. So some nice, we have got some very nice Mesolithic material, generally narrow, narrow blade microliths <coughs> and cores and things, fairly classic and not so, not dissimilar to what we're getting at nether mills further down the Dee. Um, but actually along the river, along the Dee, um, quite a strong early Neolithic component, both in the dates. Um, and it's interesting because the lithic assemblage from those trenches tends to be slightly broader. It's still blade-based, but it's broad blades. And as uh, I said, we've got these, what would have once been, we might have thought of as broad blade microliths, but they come from a pit with early Neolithic dates. So we have, I think, uh, for a long time, there's been a feeling that uh, perhaps the early Neolithic in Scotland, some of the broad blade sites might date to the early Neolithic. Um, and this would seem to... Uh, help us along that route, if you like. I won't say confirm it, because I'm not sure that anything in archaeology ever confirms anything, but um, you can see here narrow blades, just a small part of the assemblage, broader blades, much more um, frequent. So just to look at generally at the project, and obviously I'm here to blow our own trumpet, so I would say this, but Significance of this project is considerable. I mean, not just in the fact that it is adding more evidence to our picture of Mesolithic activity up in the highlands, up in the montane environments. We've got some very nice early dates up there. So it's adding to our picture. It's kind of helping us to fill in some of the missing bits in our understanding of what's going on in Mesolithic Scotland. Um, yeah, here just another nice uh, mountain picture, give you an idea of the sort of thing that you can get if you work up there with us. You do need some thick clothing. It's showing that you can get in situ material up there. 
very often when we have got sites in mountain areas before, it's been moved around. It's perhaps come up in the turves used for shielding huts or what, what that sort of thing, or where rivers have eroded and redeposited material. Here we've got in situ activity. That's really exciting. And we're working very much, as I said, with the National Trust for Scotland to try and develop the archaeological strategies for dealing with this sort of area. So far, the National Trust for Scotland take this all very seriously. It would be nice to see it rolled out into other upland areas that are managed by different people. And of course, that is an issue in Scotland where so much of our upland area is owned by private individuals. It extends across a wide landscape. We're not just talking about an individual site, but we're talking about a network, if you like. And it gives us a range of a depth to, to the activity up here, both in terms of dates, as I've shown, but also in terms of activity. Perhaps one of the most obvious is mobility, but I don't want to give you the idea that people are just moving through this landscape, that they're not using it. They're using it as well. But here you can see some of the main routeways, the Geldiburn here, the D here, through the mountains. It allows us to look at, um, yes, a whole range of dates and activities. So through time, from very earliest periods, through periods when it's actually quite surprising to find people up in these areas. Archaeologists elsewhere, Stephen Mytham working along the west coast, has suggested that Scotland might be not totally depopulated, but that population might fall dramatically during this cold event at uh, 6.2 thousand BC. If that's the case, well, it's interesting because we've got evidence of activity up here. So perhaps we need to rethink some of these things. Uh, the dates, the early dates, interestingly, come from you. So that has caused a lot of interesting scope for discussion in the pub. What's it doing up there? Where does it come from? Where did the U grow? Um, does it come in as, you know, nice sort of uh, bows and arrows type stuff? Uh, we've got evidence for that elsewhere. Or is it just coming in as, you know, a bit of tinder for the fire, left over from a previous fire that's been... Uh, brought up from places further south. Um, all of these things, this is all very much, I mean, the dates we only got back a month or so ago, so it's all very much uh, new stuff that we're still getting our heads around. Other activities, well, I mentioned salmon. I mean, there's the obvious uh, resource activities hunting perhaps up there, but not just hunting, but the things that go with it, retooling, processing the kill, processing hides, that sort of thing. Uh, there's also, there are mineral deposits up there where we've got evidence of those minerals turning up at places like Crathy's at the Mesolithic site there. So we need to start looking at interconnectivity. Raw materials, are they going for some of the raw materials, the quartz and things? Is it just a special place in the landscape? Is it a bit of everything? In Mesolithic terms, it's really interesting. And here, just taking the front cover of the um, resource assessment for Mesolithic in northeast Scotland, which Bruce Mann did, but you've got the D running here, and I've just blown it up. And you can see you're starting to get sites right along it. Um, I've been, as I said, I've been working on site at Nethermills, which is proving to be actually a pretty amazing site. Um, we've got these sites up here. We're starting to fill up the gaps in between. It would be nice to fill it up a little bit in this area. You're beginning to look at a kind of source to see project, which is not to say that people are only sticking to the D, but clearly the D provided a lot of interest in the past, and for us as archaeologists, it's turning out to be a fabulous resource for this early settlement period. And of course, moving forward in time to the Neolithic, as I said, we've got evidence of activity up in the mountains during the Neolithic. Elsewhere in Scotland, on lower land, we know that the economic 
Um, focus of life has changed. We know that people are adopting farming. Everything kind of changes. Um, what's going on in the mountains? This shows us that there's still activity going on up there. So it's interesting to try and see what's going on. Perhaps they didn't just abandon hunting and go, you know, other resources in the way that sometimes we've thought in the past. And again, we shouldn't be surprised at this. We've plenty of evidence from areas elsewhere, and these are just uh, pictures from uh, Ootsie the Iceman. It would be lovely to find something like that in the Kangons, but I think that's probably an aspiration too far. But, you know, if what we've got at Chest of D is as good as it gets, that's still pretty good. I think it challenges our concepts of marginality. We're a farming society. We think of the uplands as something, you know, wilderness to be used as a recreational resource. But, you know, is it perhaps a major route way of the past? Route ways can be deceptive, again, because we rely on cars and tarmac and things. For us, route ways are very, very obvious. You don't have to go back far for a route way to be slightly less obvious. This isn't in Scotland, for which I apologise, but um, it just kind of gets the idea of a, a route through woodland and things. And of course, route ways can be totally invisible. Um, up here in uh, Alaska, you know, routeways that are marked by piles of stones, but are really well-known routeways. You only have to do it once if you live in that society to remember your way across the land. Um, we're kind of losing that connection with the land because we all look at our iPads and Game Boys and whatever while we're driving through it. But, you know, this speaks of a very, very different engagement with the world around us. And just to return, obviously we're archaeologists, we're interested in the archaeology, but archaeology doesn't exist in isolation. And so it is really important that this whole project is integrated into the general management of the area. Um, so that is a very important strand for us. Equally, I think, Scotland has tended to be interpreted as somewhere where, you know, we still have the last remaining vestiges of wilderness in Europe, etc., etc. Maybe we have to start redefining our ideas of wilderness because we're not talking about somewhere that's untouched by human hand. We're talking about somewhere that has a long and venerable history just the same as the lowlands do, but it is manifest in different ways. So just to, to sum up, project helps to, us to complete our ideas of life in Mesolithic Scotland. It also helps us, it adds to the richness and the depth of our understanding of life as we move forward into farming periods. And it is something that we need to take seriously if we're really going to look after archaeology right across the country. Thank you very much.